Well, in just a moment, we'll turn our attention to the greatest word of prayer, and that is the word, thank you. But before we talk about giving thanks to God, could I take just a moment and thank you? This is the final message in our series on prayer that we began earlier in the year. Randy has lined up a great series for the summer. You'll be hearing more about that. It's going to be a phenomenal way for us to spend our weekends during the summer. He's also putting together a strong series of messages on the family that we will inaugurate at the AT&T Center on August the 11th when all of our campuses are together. And now it's my turn to turn my attention to writing and speaking and lots and lots of travel, speaking in churches all over the country. But before we put a wrap on this series and before I head off to that particular chapter of the year, I want to just say thank you to you. It is my highest privilege, my highest privilege to serve as a preacher in this congregation. I often tell people I would rather preach than breathe, I think. It's a good thing God doesn't make me choose between preaching and breathing. I might suffocate. I love I love the privilege. I love creating messages. I love pre- presenting messages. And, and whether I be somewhere around the world, I'm always thinking of the Oak Hills Church. And I love preaching here. I think this is the greatest church. And you make preaching fun. You really do. Uh, if, if a person can't preach at Oak Hills, they can't preach. Because you just are so kind and you're so generous. And you make it just such a joy. And here as I'm in my 25th year at the Oak Hills Church and wrapping up another series, I just wanted to, to say thank you uh, from Dean Lynn, uh, from our family to you. It's just an awesome, awesome privilege. And I've really enjoyed this series on prayer. Our, our idea has been really simple. And that is to take the great teachings of prayer and the great prayers of the Bible and see if we couldn't distill them down into a pocket-sized prayer, one that we could remember, one that could serve as an outline for our own prayers. And the result was this, and I invite you to say the prayer as it appears on the screen. God, you are good. I need help. So do they. Thank you. We begin by declaring the goodness of God. We ask him to help us. We pray for those we know who need help, but most of all, we don't say amen before we say thank you. What an important word thank you is. You know, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for Andy. Andy's our dog. A dog that Dean rescued from a shelter. He was as rangy as a coyote when we got him. He's chubby now, and he jumps in the bed with us every morning. And when we come home, he scampers around like he won the lottery when he sees somebody showing up. I'm thankful for Andy. I'm thankful for bald spots. I was standing in line at a convenience store the other day, and I looked up on the security monitor, and I thought, boy, that guy's, he's got a big bald spot. And then I realized I was looking at me. Spreading like a rain puddle. <laughs> Might as well be thankful. Besides, bald starts with B. And chocolate starts with C. So I'm thankful for chocolate. Chocolate cake. Chocolate candy. Chocolate shakes. Thankful for the rain. Do you hear the rain? Yeah. And I'm thankful for all types of chocolate. I'm convinced that Adam and Eve would have avoided the tree if somebody had given them (laughs) some chocolate. I'm thankful for dictionaries. What would we do without dictionaries? Somebody has to define the words. If D-O-G meant C-A-T to you, and R-A-T to me, we wouldn't know what to pet and what to catch and what to chase. (laughs) So I'm thankful for dictionaries. And I'm thankful for exercises like this one. It was my wife's idea, Deanland's idea, and that is use the alphabet to make a list of your blessings. Rather than catalog your burdens, 
itemize your benefits. So A is Andy, B, bald spot, C, chocolate, D, dictionary. And it dawns on me that my wife's name begins with D as well. So next time I make this list, Deanlin <laughs> Trump's dictionary, which is a lesson of the exercise. A person never runs out of opportunities to say thanks. What a great word. Thank you. Thank you. Just saying the word lifts the spirit, doesn't it? To say thanks is to celebrate a gift, anything. Bald spots, dictionaries, chocolate. To say thanks is to cross the tracks from the have-nots to the have-much. From the left out to the pulled in. Thanks says, I'm not victimized. I'm not forgotten. I'm not neglected. I'm not handicapped. I'm not overlooked. I'm not impoverished. I am blessed. Thank you. In Scripture, thanksgiving is not a good idea. It's not a suggested strategy. It's not a possible response. In Scripture... Thanksgiving is a command. Over 100 times, either by example or imperative, we are told to be thankful. Over 100 times. If quantity implies gravity, God takes Thanksgiving very seriously. Here's why. Ingratitude is the original sin. Ingratitude is the original sin. Adam and Eve had a million reasons to be grateful. Sunsets, fowls, waterfalls, virgin territory. God found the Garden of Eden so delightful that he would take strolls there during the cool of the day. Adam and Eve found the Garden of Eden so secure and safe they wore no clothes, wore no clothes, and they had nothing to hide and no one from whom to hide. It was a safe, it was a beautiful place. It was a perfect world. They were one with God, one with creation, one with each other. It was a wonderful place. If you press your ear against the early pages of the book of Genesis, you will hear Eden in concert. But then came the snake. Then came Satan, slithered into the garden, and he raised a question not about all the trees that Adam and Eve could enjoy, but about the one tree, the singular tree they could not touch. Eat of this tree, he said, and you will be like God. And just like that, Eden was not enough. It was enough, mind you. It was enough. Ecological harmony, racial, um, relational purity, spiritual peace. Adam and Eve had all they would ever need. God had told them, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth. And look at this. All the fruit trees for your food. How many fruit trees did they have from which they could eat? All of them. All of them. They had their own produce section. But there could be more, the devil said. There could be more. And with that thought, Satan introduced a germ into the pure garden, the germ of ingratitude. And Eve and Adam felt the first ever flush of discontent. Eden wasn't enough. God wasn't enough. She was missing out. God was holding out. And so rather than ponder all the fruit they had, they focused on the one fruit God forbade. And ingratitude moved in like a bully on the block. And we can only wonder, what if gratitude had won the day? What if Adam and Eve had said, 
you silly snake. Look at the orchards we have. Look at the groves we have. Let me show you our own personal watermelon patch. You, you want us to focus on the one fruit we cannot touch? Who cares? We've got more than we could ever enjoy. We can only wonder, had they chosen gratitude, would their world have been different? We can only wonder, were you to make gratitude your default emotion? Would your world be different? Oh, the hissing we hear. Don't you want more? More? More gigabytes? More horsepower? More space? More leg room? More retirement? More testosterone? Don't you want more? It's poisonous. And God's antidote for the toxin of more is a spirit of gratitude. And rather than ponder on the tree, ponder the tree you lack, focus on the Garden of Eden that you have. Gratitude. It's a daily dialysis of sorts. It flushes out the self-pity. So, the idea is simple. You want to strengthen your gratitude muscle? Declare a war on dourness and sourness with an alphabetical appreciation delineation. So my list continues. I'm thankful for flights, even the crowded ones, even the long security lines. At least I don't have to walk, right? I'm grateful. I'm grateful for golf. I'm grateful that I play so poorly that other people want to play with me because they look good. <laughs> I'm grateful for heaven. I honestly do not know what I would say at funerals if it were not for heaven. But you know, the presence of heaven makes even a graveside service a place of gratitude. Scripture says... In everything, give thanks. In everything. In traffic, give thanks. In tough times, give thanks. In hospital rooms, give thanks. In debt, give thanks. Even in interruptions, give thanks. Jesus did. He planned a retreat with his disciples. 5,000 plus people followed him. So he took him out to lunch. He told the people to sit down on the grass and he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking into heaven, what did he do? He thanked God for the food. Jesus, robustly thankful, perpetually thankful, thanking God for the children who wanted to be blessed, thanking God for the blind who wanted to be healed, thanking God for Mary who came and poured perfume over his feet. He was always thankful. So thank you, Jesus, for the example of gratitude. Thank you, King Jesus, for taking every event and making it work out for your ultimate good and your ultimate glory. Thank you, Lord, for love. I've noticed that since I've tried to have a better attitude about gratitude, I've spotted love in places I never spotted it before. In an appliance store, an elderly couple looking for a stove were holding hands, weathered and leathered hands, Love, love in the front yard of our neighborhood when I saw a dad tossing a baseball to an excited and happy kid who apparently was breaking in a brand new baseball glove. Love everywhere when you look for it. Miracles. When you look for them, you find them. Rebecca Taylor has found them. Rebecca Taylor, according to the doctor, scores a 12 
on a scale of pain that registers one to ten. She lives in pain every day. Pretty tough challenge, but she's a pretty tough kid. She's only ten years old. She has fudge brown hair and eyes that sparkle and a weatherproof smile and she has a book of miracles. She showed it to me in the hospital room. I I thought she was asleep. I went into the room and I looked at all the handmade posters on the hospital room wall. A covey of stuffed animals on the couch. Somebody had delivered her a cookie bouquet. I was taking a serious look at it and But then she woke up and she said, Mommy, can you show Max my miracle book? It's a spiral notebook, edges weathered, adorned with crayon flowers, stars, and a few clowns. And when you open it, you begin to read the miracles written in Rebecca's hand. Miracle. I slept all night last night. Miracle. Daddy's snuck a puppy into the hospital (laughs) miracle mommy's going to place a Christmas tree in the corner she's back in the hospital this weekend and we need to pray for her and we need to be thankful for her And while everybody else is concerned and confused and while Rebecca is certainly in pain she has decided in all circumstances, in the midst of it all, to be a model of gratitude. I had to admit, I've never kept a miracle book. Maybe you haven't either. Maybe we should. If Rebecca can find reasons to give thanks, can't we? So the alphabet gratitude continues. God, thank you for naps. The miracle that happens on a couch on Saturday and Sunday afternoons. Thank you, God, for, oh, oh, it's beautiful. Oh, a rainbow. Oh, that was good. Oh, you look nice. All the O's. I've never thanked God for all the O's, and there are so many. I thank God for P, Ponce. Just those flat circles of moisture that we come across in a land that's so prone to drought. Q. Hmm. Lord, what am I grateful for? How about this? Queens, New York. I spent a day there a few months back. People were so nice. They took me to a Korean restaurant. Lord, I never stopped to say thank you for the wonderful people of Queens, New York. And Lord, how long has it been since I stopped to thank you for Running water, water hydrants, water faucets, showers, bathtubs, water spigots, everywhere, everywhere, and it's clean and it's healthy. Thank you, Lord. It occurs to me if I thank God for running water, I'm going to be thanking God all day long. And nothing cures the grumps like gratitude, and nothing troubles God like grumblers. I've read about grumblers in the Bible. The Israelites just released from Egyptian captivity made an art form out of belly aching. They began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? And we hate this horrible manna. You know, only a month earlier they were slaves. Only 30 days earlier. They were making bricks that they would use to build, with which they would build pyramids. Still have the whip marks on their back. They still have the calluses on their hands. But then all of a sudden, liberation came. You remember how the Red Sea opened, how manna began to fall like silver dollars from the heavens. And how did they respond? They grumbled. Take us back to Egypt they said and God responded he responded by sending snakes into their camp shades of the garden of Eden snakes 
scaled vermin slithered through their tents. The symbolism is inescapable. Ingratitude comes from the devil, and ingratitude can kill you. Many were bitten and died. And then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. And then the Lord told him, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and he attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. God's cure for the ungrateful spirit is look up at the work of God. Look up what he has done. Look how he has taken the devil himself and freeze-framed him, turned him into bronze and put him on a pole. A millennia and a half later, Jesus remembered this object lesson. And Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. God's cure for ingratitude is look up at what Jesus has done. How Satan is destroyed and how Christ is supreme. We Christians, like the Hebrews, we can bellyache. We can groan. But Jesus gives us the same command. Look up. Look at what Jesus has done. Look up. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us a Savior. Thank you, Lord, for the triumph over the grave. You have defeated death once and for all. Thank you, dear Lord, for this universe that is being reclaimed and will someday be full of your glory again. Thank you, Lord, for the ultimate victory that comes to every single person. Church, God's plan for the grumpy and sad and discouraged spirit is simply this. Thank you. Thank you. His solution to any challenge is a grateful spirit. The quickest way out of the valley of despair is that narrow little trail called thank you. While everyone else grumbles, you be the one who is grateful. Jack Ryan teaches us this. I know pastors aren't supposed to have their favorites. But Jack Ryan... You know what? You would more quickly find a moose on the moon than you would find Jack Ryan with a complaint. From the beginning of the service to the very end, hands extended in worship from the first song to the last verse. He not only served as an elder of this church, he served as an example to this church of the power of a grateful spirit. When heart disease began taking his strength, he was not able to be in the services. And Deanlin and I paid him a visit on a Sunday afternoon. His energy was gone. His sleep was scarce. I pulled a chair up next to his. Jack, are you not doing well? And he looked at me and he said, oh, I'm doing great. I said, they say you can't sleep. He said, no. I don't sleep much, but I can pray. I just talk to Jesus. I tell him I love him. I tell him how good he is. I tell him thanks. He said, these are good times for me. I'm just talking to Jesus. Poor circulation took his color and disease had sapped his vigor. His hands trembled and skin draped like cloths from his bones. Yet you would have thought he was a kid on Christmas Eve. And in a sense, he was. Because by the next morning, he was in the presence of Jesus. Who is the real victor in life? Is he the one who has much? Or is he not the one who has much gratitude? Is he the one who collects things? Or is he not the one who collects reasons to be thankful to God? 
My friend Rick Ashley is a minister in Fort Worth. He told me recently of a member of his congregation who's battled muscular sclerosis for much of his adult life. But he continues to serve people through mail, through letters, through notes. Rick wrote him a note and said, how can I pray for you? And the man wrote him back with a list of 18 things for which to be grateful and four things for which to pray. Wheelchair bound. And unless God intervenes, we'll never stand again. And yet his list of things for which to be grateful far outnumbers his requests. So who is the real victor in life? He who lives and dies in gratitude. So the list continues. How about walks? With friends, with family. How about, I'm thankful for x-rays, and xylophones, and God's extra grace, because there's not very many words to start with x. <laughs> grateful for yellowtail finches. And I'm grateful for zebras. And I'm grateful for stories like the one that comes from the missionary to Tobago. The story that Jack Hinton tells about leading worship at a colony of people who had been struck with leprosy. And when he asked the colony that had gathered for worship, if they had any song requests, a lady from behind him said, I have a request. He turned. He saw what he described as the most hideous face he had ever seen. No nose, no ears, no lips. She raised a fingerless hand and said, could we please sing, count your many blessings? A friend of his heard the story and said, Jack, you'll never, sing that, you'll never sing that song again. He said, oh, I'll sing it all the time, but I'll just never sing it the same way. The ability to find blessings and to live with a spirit of gratitude. May God hear us and find within us that kind of spirit. Say with me the prayer once again, shall we? God, you are good. You're my daddy. You're in charge. Your kingdom come. I need help. Heal me. Encourage me. Lead me. Pardon me. So do they. Those I love. Those I don't. This hurting world. Thank you. Lord, this prayer is a prayer we offer in the sweet and powerful name of Jesus Christ. By his authority. By his accomplishment.